So a package just arrived. One night, about two months ago, I was having trouble sleeping, and I did a thing I sometimes do when I can't sleep, which is I browse eBay on my phone, like looking for unusual instruments, that sort of thing. As you've probably guessed, I ended up ordering something that night, something which just arrived. It's a children's synthesizer from the former Soviet Union. It was made sometime between 1989 and 1993. Interestingly, the cartoon character of a dog on the front panel is of a French comic book character named Beef. Apparently, Beef was quite popular with kids in the USSR, so they um, put him on a synthesizer. So before I can actually try this thing out, I need to find a way of powering it. This device can be made to run on batteries, but it uses some archaic Soviet size, and I doubt I'll have much luck tracking those down. Instead, I'm going to try to fashion some sort of power adapter for it. It has a plug on the back that uses these two holes. Obviously, I don't have anything like that, so I'm just going to have to rig something up. The unit says 9B, which I'm assuming means 9 volts. I found this old adapter in my box of power adapters. The power adapter I found is 8 volts, 700 milliamps. Hopefully that's close enough and I don't end up frying the thing. So I've just cut off the connector from the power adapter, and I've labeled the positive and negative wires with a piece of tape. Now I'm just going to insert the two bare wires into the holes on the back of the synth. Make sure to put the negative in the minus hole and the positive in the plus hole. Okay, let's try this thing out. I'm guessing the red button is the power switch. Okay, we've got sound. So it's completely out of tune, but it sounds really cool. Like the bass is much thicker and richer than I expected. So these buttons let me switch octaves. I wonder what this button does. Okay, so vibrato. I can't begin to describe how loud this thing is. Uh, this was presumably made for kids, but like the idea that you would give something this loud to a kid is just unthinkable. I almost wonder if some component is failing and that's causing it to be louder than it would have been back in the day. Let's try this knob. Ah, cool, so that changes the timbre, sort of a low-pass filter kind of thing. So obviously it's completely out of tune, but it's not out of tune in a consistent way. It's as if each key is uniquely out of tune somehow. Okay, so to fix the tuning, we have to open it up. Luckily, the whole thing is just held together with three screws. So the way this thing's laid out is actually pretty cool. Each key is connected to a variable resistor. The value that that resistor is set to determines the pitch of the key. In theory, all I have to do is get an instrument tuner and then hold down each key and turn the resistor until the key is in tune. Unfortunately, things are a little more complicated. The variable resistors are all wired up in series, which means that the current flows from one into the next into the next which means that it's a sum total of all of the keys to the right of whatever key you're looking at that determine the pitch of that one key. So if any one of those keys is out of tune, all of the keys to the left will also be out of tune. Of course, we've got this keyboard flipped upside down, so left is right and right is left, but you get the idea. So to tune this, we start at the very top of the scale, we tune that, then we work our way down. I'm using this letter opener to turn the resistor and I'm going to just turn it until the tuner says that it's in tune. And now we repeat the process for the next note, and the next note, and so on and so forth, all the way down the keyboard. All told, it took me about 45 minutes to tune this, partly because I ended up having to solder in a replacement resistor from my own stash. While I've got the case open, I might as well install a quarter inch jack so that I can record it better. This thing actually has an audio output, but it uses this archaic connector which I've actually never seen before. Apparently they were pretty common in the USSR. Anyway, I'm going to unsolder that old connector and I'm going to solder in the brand new quarter inch jack I'm installing. Okay, let's put this thing back together. Ah, much better. Never been so happy to hear a scale in my whole life. Now let's hear how it sounds if we bypass the speaker and use the jack we installed. Sounds pretty different. I'm actually pretty excited about the way this sounds. So for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time with analog synths, this 
sound that this thing produces may sound a little bit like video game music or something like that. But these kinds of raw analog waveforms form pretty much the basis for all analog synths. Uh, take something like a Moog synth. Uh, it starts out with something like that, and then generally you'll use a low-pass filter to kind of filter it down. In fact, let's try that. I happen to have a Moog filter right here in the form of the brand new Moog Mavis. If we take the output from this Soviet synth and patch it into the Mavis, not bad at all. By the way, here's what the unfiltered waveform looks like. It's not a square wave, it's not a saw wave, it's whatever this is. Let's uh, try to make some music with this thing. As you can see, I've got Ableton Live up on my computer. Let's record a bass line. Okay, that's our initial bass line, pretty simple. I'm just gonna pull in a drum loop to make it sound a little more like a real piece of music. Now let's add a melody. Okay, this thing's pretty usable. Now that I've got a workable instrument on my hands, it's time to do some historical research. So here's one thing I didn't mention up top. When I first ordered this synth, I didn't really look very carefully at the listing, and I failed to notice where it was actually coming from. So I was pretty surprised when a package arrived from Ukraine. And not just any part of Ukraine, but the exact part of the country that is experiencing the brunt of Russian attacks right now. Needless to say, I would have totally understood if this package just never showed up. So once I knew that it came from Ukraine, I really wanted to see if I could figure out who actually made the synth. So I decided to look back at eBay. There are a handful of listings for this exact same synth on eBay, and a few on Reverb, and a bunch on Russian language auction sites. By the way, if you Google USSR synths, there's a whole world of synthesizers that were made in the former Soviet republics. Many of them are for kids, but there's some models that are quite sophisticated and now quite desirable. Anyway, when I looked into it, I noticed that almost all of the synths that are available right now seem to be located in Ukraine. In fact, many of the cities where sellers are located have been in the news recently as they were hit especially hard by the Russian invasion. So since there's so many of these located in Ukraine, I just assumed they were probably also made there. Now, while my synth didn't come with any paperwork whatsoever, many of the listings I found feature photos of the manual. I spent several hours doing OCR and Google Translate on the various phrases I found in those photos. The manual refers to this as an electro-musical instrument, which seems accurate. It's actually a really great manual because it has complete electrical specs, including hand-drawn schematics. It also has music for some simple songs. Finally, I stumbled on this photo, which featured what seemed to be an address. The address is in the Ukrainian city of Romny. I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong. So I can find the city on Google Maps pretty easily, but I can't find the actual address. Unfortunately, the long number there is an outdated postal code. At some point after the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine switched to a new system of postal codes, but still this old address proved useful. When I googled it, I came up with this listing, which features that address and lists the factory name as being this. So I copied and pasted and searched for the factory and came up with a listing for that very same factory using a modern address with a modern postal code. According to this, apparently the factory was mainly producing automatic telephone equipment. That's actually what the ATC and the factory's name stands for. But it also lists electronic musical equipment and musical toys. So we definitely have the right factory. Now that we have this new modern address, we can look it up on Google Maps. And here is the factory. Needless to say, it is no longer operational. There have been a few articles written about this city, Romney. Apparently it had been quite a successful industrial town, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, the factories shut down and it fell on hard times. About 11 years ago, somebody actually went into this building and took photographs. As you can see, there's not much left. It's sad that the factory is such a mess, but still kind of cool to see where this thing was made. Anyway, these were made from the late 80s until at least 1993. And of course, they were made expressly for children. 
I read a post on a Ukrainian message board where somebody said they had some of these in their kindergarten, which were used for music education. I can't help but wonder who might have played my synth. You know, was it just one kid? Was it a school? Maybe it was used by a bunch of kids. A synth made in 1990 for a five-year-old would mean that the five-year-old was like 36, 37 now. To get a sense of what kind of music those kindergartners might have been playing and singing, I decided to look back at the songs in the manual. The first one is a song called May There Always Be Sunshine. It's a Soviet anti-war song written in the early 1960s. It's the kind of song that can easily seem cheesy or dated. But given the state of Ukraine right now, the lyrics feel surprisingly resonant. It's about a boy expressing hope that the things he loves about his life, sunshine and his mother, can continue to exist despite the threat of war. If you'd like to support Ukraine, there are links in the description to this video. Also in the description to this video is a link to a sample library. I sampled this instrument and I turned it into a decent sampler sample library. So if you're a musician, you can download that for free and incorporate the sounds of this rare instrument in your own compositions. If you enjoyed this video, now is a great time to subscribe. I've got a ton of videos on the way. Also, there's a Patreon. It costs $5 and every month you get a sample library. Okay, I think that's it. See you soon.